Hello, welcome to today's geography lesson. Today we're going to discuss synoptic charts and global air circulation. Now, I bet many of you is already familiar with both these terms because we discussed them in grade 10 and in grade 11. Now, the global air circulation, we're just going to revise from the grade 11 syllabus and synoptic charts we did in grade 10 and 11. Now basically by now you should know a synoptic chart is basically like a weather map. The first thing that you learned in grade 10 about climatology was the difference between weather and climate. Now obviously by now you should know climate takes over, place over a period of 20 years and weather happens on a daily basis. Now with the synoptic charts there's key things to remember. What I like about synoptic charts, all the answers are usually right in front of you. Now, if we go to our first slide, we will see that when you look at synoptic charts, if you can revise from grade 10 and grade 11, you will see that synoptic charts is full of these lines. These lines are known as isobars. Now, these lines represent pressure. Now, exactly the same what you've learned in grade 10 and 11 regarding map work, isobars is lines joining places with equal pressure. For instance, in map work, you've learned that the lines joining places with equal height on a map. Now, basically, we're going to look at two things that are very important on a synoptic chart, the type of pressure systems that we find on them. Now, pressure is measured in millibars and hectopascals. Now, the two pressures that I want to discuss with you today is patterns that form over them. And the first one I want to discuss is a low pressure. Now very importantly, if you look at the low pressure, it's decreasing towards the inside of these isobars. Now, if you look at the characteristics of a low pressure system, it's associated with rising air. Now grade 12s, what's quite important over here, when air rises, we associate it with warm conditions. Now, if I can give you an example, let's say for instance boiling water, you boil water, what does it do? It evaporates, it rises. Now, same principle happens with air. As soon as it's hot, the air starts to rise. Another example how the air can rise is when it's forced to rise. Now, very importantly over here, you're going to see it as we continue with the grade 12 syllabus, it usually happens when warm air and cold air converges. Now by now, hopefully you know that cold air is much heavier than warm air. So what does it do? It forces the warm air to rise. Very importantly, if we can go back to our previous diagram, the circulation of a low pressure cell in the southern hemisphere is clockwise circulation. Now just to keep in mind, if I can quickly draw a globe over here, we are situated in the southern hemisphere and these low pressure systems will turn will turn clockwise. Now, keep in mind, once again, characteristics of this low-pressure systems is usually warm air. Now, the warm air rises. It's usually, the air can rise because it's being forced to rise. And very importantly, in the Southern Hemisphere, it's a clockwise circulation of air taking place. So, obviously, in the air circulation in a low-pressure system in the Southern Hemisphere, is clockwise circulation. Now, very importantly, it's vice versa in the northern hemisphere, and the air circulation is anti-clockwise. Now, when we look at the low pressure systems, I want you to remember, it's usually rising air. What do we associate rising air with? Warm conditions, or usually when the air is being forced to rise. Now, let's just quickly look at high pressure systems. A high pressure system is usually associated with cold conditions. It's usually when air sinks. 
Now, I'm going to use a blue color pen over here to show you the circulation in the southern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, it's going to be an anti-clockwise circulation of air. Now, high pressure systems are usually associated with cool temperatures that usually sink. Now, just imagine this. Let's say, for instance, you jump into a swimming pool. Where do you find the coldest water? On the bottom of the swimming pool, on the surface of it. And the warmer water will be on top of it. That's exactly the same way how air works. Now, if you look at the characteristics of a high pressure system, we know it's cold conditions, usually. And the air sinks. And if you look at the air circulation of high pressure systems in the southern hemisphere, it's usually anti-clockwise. And in the northern hemisphere, it's usually a clockwise circulation. The three points that I really want to concentrate on today is the following three. So, when we look at the three points that I want to highlight today, it's basically that you need to know that high pressure is usually sinking air, that the air sinks because of cold conditions, and it's an anti-clockwise circulation of air in the southern hemisphere. Now, very importantly, when we discuss an optic chart, like I've mentioned before, there's many lines that represent the pressure, and they are known as isobars. Now, every single day a synoptic chart has been printed by the South Africa Weather Service. Now, to indicate the weather, like I've mentioned before, weather happens on a daily basis. We use weather station models. Now, I bet you guys are definitely familiar with it. When we look at the weather station model, it's a small model looking like this. And it's got a set of information that can help us to describe the weather of the current day. For instance, the air temperature is 27 degrees Celsius. The dew point temperature that we experience is 24 degrees. Now, very important, Great Falls. Some of you make the mistake to see the dew point temperature as the minimum temperature. Keep in mind, dew point temperature is where condensation takes place. Now, what is condensation? is when the gas, the water that's been evaporated, turns back into a liquid. Now, precipitation is any form of water that falls to the surface. In this case, we experience rain. Then, the body of the weather station is the circle over here. That represents the cloud cover. Now, you've learned in grade 10, how do we, how do we measure cloud cover? By using our eyes. In this, in this case over here, you can see that the whole circle has been colored in, so that means it's overcast conditions. And when we look at the wind speed and wind direction, as you can see, it's attached to the body of the cloud cover over there. That gives us a northwest direction. How do I know that? Because if you look at your weather station model, this is where north is. There's east, there's south, and there's west, as you can see in the northwest direction. The wind speed that's been allocated over there is 15 knots. Now let's just quickly move down to the each key that we actually use. As you can see, the cloud cover is being expressed in quarters. Now obviously if there's if you can see the circle over here, a clear circle means it's clear conditions. There's no cloud clouds whatsoever in the sky. If you look at this one over here, three quarters. It means it's cloudy, right? And overcast conditions when it's usually raining, there's a lot of clouds in the sky. The wind speed are measured in knots. Five knots, very importantly, been drawn like this. Ten knots, like that. And 15 knots, a long and a short one attached to the direction of the wind. Now, the precipitation that we can discuss is as follows. You get rain, drizzle, showers, snow, hail, fog, and mist. Now, obviously, in the interior of South Africa, we experience thunderstorms, most likely over here. In high areas like the Jogsburg Mountains, we experience that. Okay, so this is quite key. Now, very important that you need to remember Great Falls. 
when we ask to explain, discuss the type of weather that's being experienced, let's say in Johannesburg for the specific day, you need to use these elements to describe the weather. So if the question in the exam states, describe the weather that Johannesburg is experiencing today, you need to refer to it as following. We're experiencing an air temperature of 27 degrees Celsius, a dew point temperature of 24 degrees Celsius. We might experience rain, we're experiencing rain, cloud cover is overcast, we're experiencing a northwest direction wind, and it blows 15 knots. Now that's what's making synoptic charts so much fun. That information is on the synoptic chart. All you need to do is describe it from the synoptic chart. So you don't need to go and look for the answer, it's right in front of you. Now, very importantly, like I've mentioned, to describe the current conditions, this is what you use. Now, in the exam, you're going to be asked a summer synoptic chart or a winter synoptic chart. The easiest way to go and look between the difference between a summer synoptic chart and a winter synoptic chart straight away is the date. Now, obviously, you know we live in the Southern Hemisphere. When do we experience summer? November, December, January. When do we experience winter? Usually during June, July. So that's the first thing I will go and have a look at just to identify which season the synoptic chart is in. And then there's a couple of characteristics that you need to pay attention when you're looking at this summer synoptic chart or winter synoptic chart. For instance, over here, I have a summer synoptic chart. But now, the most important thing over here, have a look at the date. It's the 24th of January, 2011. So that's a straight giveaway. Immediately you know it's summer. The second thing that you need to be able to identify is this low pressure system over here. Now, a couple of slides back, we discussed the different type of pressure systems. And we discussed the low pressure system. And what's the first characteristic that we discussed about it? It's rising air. And why is the air rising? Because of warm conditions. And when do we experience warm conditions? Usually during the summer. Now keep in mind, what's the circulation of air in the low pressure system? Clockwise circulation. Another tip to give you, that's a straight giveaway, Look at the air temperatures of your weather station models. Look at the city of Zimbabwe, Bulawayo, a maximum temperature of 20 degrees. Unfortunately, our synoptic chart is a bit unclear over here, but if you look at the Limpopo province, you can see that the maximum temperature over there is 28 degrees Celsius. Now, later during the programs, we're going to learn about tropical cyclones. Now, tropical cyclones is low-pressure systems that develop in tropical regions. It only develops in tropical regions that experience high temperatures. And as you can see, there's a tropical cyclone over there, and that's another indication that it's in summer. Very importantly as well, we got we, South Africa is dominated by a high-pressure belt. That's situated right over here. And you will see that the South Atlantic high pressure system has migrated to the north. And the South Indian high pressure system has migrated northeast. And very importantly, when we go into our next slide, the Kalahari high pressure system is not present in the summer due to because of weak subsistence and warm temperatures. Please stay with us, we're just quickly going for a quick break. Welcome back. Now, we've ex explained the summer synoptic chart conditions. Just to quickly recap, most importantly, pay attention to your date indicate summer overlay. 
Secondly, there's a low pressure system over the interior. It's warm conditions, rising air. Thirdly, go to your actual weather station models on your synoptic chart. Now what you will see is you will usually see high temperatures. And thirdly, your South Atlantic high pressure and your South Indian high pressure, the South Atlantic high pressure has migrated towards the north. And your South Indian high pressure has migrated northeast. As you can see, there's no Kalari high pressure system over the interior. Now let's just quickly go and have a look at our winter synoptic charts. Now, in South Africa, especially the Western Cape and the interior, we experience cold front conditions. So what's, that's one characteristic that we can go and have a look at. Secondly, the Kalari high pressure system. Thirdly, the date, exactly like the same that we did with the summer synoptic chart. And then again, we can go and have a look at our South Indian high pressure system and the South Atlantic high pressure system and the way they migrated during the seasons. Now, obviously, as you know, during winter, if we look at our daily temperatures, we will expect that we experience quite low temperatures, cool conditions. Now, let's go and have a look at the synoptic chart. Our first clue over there, July 23rd, 2011. So, as you know, obviously, we experience winter conditions, season of winter. Now, secondly, like I've mentioned, we experience mid-latitude cyclones, cold fronts. Now, as you know, cold fronts create very cold conditions in the interior of South Africa, and it provides rainfall for the Western Cape area. So that's our second clue that we have over there. Our third clue, we can just go and have a look at the weather station models of Pretoria situated over there. As you can see, Pretoria experienced a low temperature of only 20 degrees Celsius. And very importantly, if you look at the weather station model, there's no cloud cover whatsoever. The reason why we don't have experienced any cloud cover over the interior of Southern Africa is because the Kalahari high pressure system is situated over the interior. Now, what do we know about the Kalahari high pressure system? What do we know about the high pressure systems in general? First of all, we've learned that it's sinking air. And when air sinks, it's usually because of cold conditions. As you can see with the South Atlantic high pressure system, it has migrated towards the south. And later on, we will have a look at the influence of it. Now, the South Atlantic high pressure system has migrated towards the south. Now, this to the north, excuse me, to the north. So basically what happens, that's the reason why mid-latitude cyclones have a severe effect on South Africa's climate during winter. And the South Indian high pressure system has also migrated towards the north during the winter. Now, in the exams, you need to be able to distinguish between both of them. Very importantly, you need to be able to identify your weather station models. Now, I just want to do a quick example for you with a weather station model. Now, very importantly, grade 12s, you need to be able to describe the weather of a place. Now, if I give you the following information, let's say, for instance, we experience a temperature of 24 degrees, we experience a dew point temperature of 18, we experiencing thunderstorms, we experience wind speed of up to five knots, we experience the wind direction in a, let's say, southeast direction. And we experience cloud covers three quarters. Now, if this set of information is given to you during the exam, you need to be able to go and draw your own weather station model. Always start with your cloud cover, the body of the weather station model. Now, three quarters, you go and look at your references.
Then start with your temperature. As you can see, the air temperature is 24 degrees Celsius. The dew point temperature, again, great holes. Please remember, it's not minimum temperature. Dew point temperature is where condensation takes place. It's 18 degrees. The type of precipitation that we might experience during the day, or are experiencing during the day, is thunderstorms, and the symbol for thunderstorms looks like that. Our wind direction is southeast, and our wind speed is five knots. Now this is how you draw a weather station model, and if you need to describe a weather station model, once again, refer to your temperature. It's 24 degrees Celsius. It's 18 degrees dew point temperature. We're experiencing thunderstorms. We have three quarters cloud cover. The wind direction is southeast, and wind speed is five knots. Okay, now that you need to basically learn how to draw a weather station model, always keep in mind, describe the weather according to the station that you've drawn or that you need to be able to get the information from. Now, grade 12, it's a guarantee that you will get a summer synoptic chart or a winter synoptic chart in your final exam. Most importantly, the biggest clue is your date. And obviously look at the temperatures of your weather station models and look at your atmospheric patterns, for instance, low pressure systems and high pressure systems that develops during summer and winter. Winter, same scenario. In South Africa, usually experience cold fronts, the Kalahari high pressure system is over the interior of southern Africa. An easy way to be able to identify that, once again, when you look at your weather station systems, weather station models, pardon me, you will see that it's clear blue skies. Why clear blue skies? Because of sinking air. Keep in mind, grade 12, clouds can't form when it's sinking air. Clouds formation takes place with rising air, and it's usually the rising air that cools down, it condenses, and we've got cloud formation taking place. And a straight giveaway, once again, go and look at your low temperatures. There's a synoptic chart that we discussed. As you can see, the Kalahari high pressure system is over the interior. The date is a get dead giveaway, and you can go and have a look at your temperatures. It's quite low. Now, our next topic that I want to discuss with you, we did it in grade 11, global air circulation. Now, global air circulation is very important to understand the movement of air. Now, before I'm going to start this topic, Air moves in two ways, horizontally, sorry, horizontally or vertically. When it moves vertically, we look at low pressure systems and we look at high pressure systems. When it moves horizontally, we look at wind. It's known as wind. Now, what is wind? It's basically that air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure. And we know if air moves vertically upwards, it's known as a low pressure. And when air sinks, it's known as a high pressure. Now, with the synoptic charts, what do we know about low pressure system? It's rising air because of warmer conditions. We know it's rising air because it's being forced to rise. What do you know about high pressure systems? It's sinking air because of cold conditions. And very much importantly, air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure, and that is known as wind. Now, we experience different types of pressure systems all around the world. And the simple reason why we experience them is because of the different insulation 
that the surface receives. Now, in grade 10, you've learned about insulation, heating of the earth surface. Insulation stands for incoming solar radiation. Now, obviously, different parts in the world warms up and is warmer than other parts of the world. And we're going to have a look how it influences the different pressure systems that we experience all around the world. Now, first and foremost, let's go back to the basics. In grade 10, like I've mentioned, you've learned about insulation. Incoming solar radiation from the sun. Now, obviously, radiation heats up the surface of the Earth. Now, obviously, the shorter the distance that these sun rays travel from the sun, how warmer it's going to be. How further it needs to travel, how cold it's going to be. Now, as you know it, if you look at the equatorial regions, basically the warmest conditions that we experience on the Earth's surface. And where do we experience the coldest conditions on the Earth's surface? Yes, the polar regions over here. The simple reason for it is because the insulation from the sun is the greatest distance between that and the sun. And obviously, if you look at the equatorial regions, experience the warmest conditions because the insulation travels the shortest distance to this region over here. Now immediately, what type of pressure do, we, do you think we experience at the equatorial regions? Now keep in mind, very warm conditions, lots of insulation, what type of pressure are we going to experience? A low pressure. At the polar regions, now you've seen it on TV, if you look at the polar regions, South Pole, North Pole, it's usually covered with what? Ice and snow, right? So what can we say? We experience very cold conditions. Now if you think of equatorial regions, you usually see the Amazon jungle, warm conditions, tropical waters, tropical jungles, etc. And if you look at the polar regions, very cold conditions that's associated with snow and ice. Now, immediately, what can we establish? At the polar regions, we experience high pressure systems. And at the equatorial regions, we experience low pressure systems. After the break, I would like to discuss the global air circulation in detail with you. Welcome back after the break. Obviously, we've been discussing global air circulation. And just before the break, we have established the movement of air. Vertical movement of air, if the air rises, to low pressure. When the air sinks, it's known as a high pressure. The movement of air horizontally is known as wind, and wind moves from a high pressure to a low pressure. Now, to explain the global air circulation, I'm going to draw my own diagram with that set of information over there in my own diagram. Now, we have already established, let me just quickly wipe. Let me just wipe this out. Simple reason why is that I struggle to see the black. So let's just use nice colors, bright colors. Okay. So obviously, right here, center bang in the middle, we have the equator. Then we have the 30 degree latitude line. That's where we actually are, South Africa. We are dominated by a high pressure belt. Then we got the subtropical, subpolar low pressure belt. And then we got the polar regions. Now, grade 12, we already established, right? 
The reason why the equator experienced much warmer conditions is because of the insulation that it receives. The distance that the insulation travels is much shorter over there than over there. And in fact, if I walk towards the equator, what's going to happen with the temperatures? It's going to increase. If I walk towards the polar regions, what's going to happen with the temperature? It's going to decrease because of less insulation. Now, very importantly over here, the type of pressure that we experience at the equator is a low pressure. Why is it a low pressure? Because it's warm tropical climates. It's warm temperatures every single day. Believe it or not, the equatorial regions don't actually experience winter. Why? Because of the amount of insulation it receives every single day. Now, I'm going to jump straight from the equator to our polar regions. And if you look at the polar regions, like the South Pole, what do we know? We experience very cold temperatures. If you look on the TV, it's usually covered with ice and snow. Now, what type of pressure do we associate cold temperatures with? A high pressure. So am I right when I'm saying that the polar regions experience a high pressure? So this whole 90 degree latitude line is dominated by a high pressure belt. Now, if you look at the equator, it's rising air because of warm conditions. What do we know? It's a low pressure. Now, for argument's sake, if I go and climb Kilimanjaro, I'm standing right here and I'm going to climb near Kilimanjaro, what's going to happen with the temperature? In altitude, what happens with temperature in altitude? Temperature, temperature decreases. Now, as this air rises at the equatorial regions, what happens? It rises, it cools, condenses, cloud formation takes place. So it rains. But in grade 10, you've learned about the structure of the atmosphere. We experience divergence of air in the upper atmosphere. Divergence is when something moves away from one another. Convergence, when something moves towards one another. In grade 10, you've learned about uh, moving plates. If something comes together, it's convergence. When something moves away from one another, it's divergence. Now, as the air diverges in the upper atmosphere, eventually what will happen? It will cool down again. Now, like I've mentioned, if I'm climbing Kilimanjaro and I go up in altitude, what's happening with the temperature is decreasing. Now, at the 30 degree latitude, because of the divergence taking place right over here, the air starts to sink. Right? Because it's moving from a higher altitude to a lower altitude. Now, as the air comes to the surface, what happens? The air can't go right through the surface. Am I right? So, once again, as you can see, the air can't go straight through the surface. What's happening with it? Divergence taking place. Now, with all this rising air at the equatorial regions, it's leaving a void. So what happens? With the divergence taking place at the 30 degree latitude line, it's getting sucked up here at the equatorial regions. And when air comes together, it's known as convergence. And what do we call this area between zero and five degrees? The ITCZ, Intertropical Convergence Zone. The name basically gives the way. Intertropical, it's a tropical regions all around the equator. Air is converging over here because it's coming from the high pressure systems over there. Now the air rises. Now keep in mind there's a void being left. So the air is getting sucked in from the subtropical high pressure systems over here. Now, as the air diverges at the 30 degree uh, latitude line, what happens? Let's move back 
to the polar regions quickly. Obviously, what do we know? It's a high pressure system because it's sinking air. It can't go through the surface, so divergence takes place. Now, please pay special attention to the 60 degree latitude. There's divergence taking place over there and divergence taking place over here. Now, what happens over here, great source? Convergence. Look what happens over here. From the one side, we have cold air coming in. From the other side, we have warm coming in, warm air coming in. So, what do we know by now? If warm air and cold air have to collide, what's the cold air going to do with the warm air? It's going to force it upwards. So, what's being created over here? A low pressure. Not because of warm conditions, like at the equatorial regions, but because the air is being forced to rise, because it's where there's convergence of cold air and warm air. Now, what basically develops over here, we've got rising air at the equatorial region, so that's the equatorial low pressure belt that developed over there. Now, where the air sinks at the 30 degree latitude line, that's a high pressure belt. And at the 60 degree latitude, where there's cold polar air and warm subtropical air coming and gliding, convergence of air, the warm air is being forced to rise, we experience a subpolar low pressure belt. Now, like we've mentioned in the beginning of this episode, a low pressure system is rising air because of warm condition. So obviously, the equatorial region, we can tick that box. Or it's rising air because the air is being forced to rise, as you can see from this warm subtropical air and cold polar air converging to one another. And then obviously high pressure systems over there, as you can see, a sinking air because of very cold conditions. And as you can see, the high pressure system over here develops because of divergence in the upper atmosphere and sinking air over the 30 degree latitude. Now very importantly, let's not forget the movement of this low pressure and high pressure systems in the southern hemisphere. Anti-clockwise, clockwise, anti-clockwise. Okay. Now, that's the vertical movement of air. Now, with this vertical movement of air, we got three distinct cells that formed. The polar cell, the feral cell, and Hadley cell. Let's just quickly go back to our information on top of the page. There you got your polar cell, your feral cell, and your Hadley cell. As you can see, the warm air rising, cold air sinking. Okay, divergence taking place, sinking, sinking. Right, so our three distinct pressure cells have developed, the polar, feral, and Hadley. Now, the next thing I want to explain to you, we've looked at the vertical circulation of air, vertical movement of air. Now, let's just quickly look at the horizontal movement of air. Now, very importantly, I've explained to you that air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure. So in theory, air moves from there in a straight line to there, in a straight line to there, from the high pressure to low pressure. But unfortunately, it doesn't. Now in grade 11, you've learned about Kuroles force. Now what is Kuroles force? It's the deflection of the winds by the Earth's rotation around its own axis. Now the simple rule of thumb is, if you stand with your wind against the back in the southern hemisphere, 
the wind will deflect to your left. When you stand with your back to the wind in the northern hemisphere, the wind will deflect to your right. Now, let's say for argument's sake, the air blows from the high pressure to the low pressure, and we are in the southern hemisphere, which is the wind going to deflect to? To your left. Now, let's just quickly go back to our diagram over here. Because of Coriolis force, the air doesn't move in a straight line from the high pressure to the low pressure. So what happens? It deflects to the left. Right? When this name from direction is coming from? North, east, south, west. Right? So what do we call these winds? The polar easterlies. As you can see, we've got the polar easterlies over there. Now, the air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure, but because of Coriolis force, it's deflected to the left. What did we experience over there? There? Westerlies, and air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure, but in the southern hemisphere, it deflects to the left. And we got tropical easterlies. If we click a little bit on the next page, because of the deflection, we got a tropical easterlies. Why the tropical easterlies? Because it's very close to the equator. If you look at the polar easterlies, why the polar easterlies? Because it's very close to the polar, polar, polar areas. 90 degree latitude line, and if you look at the westerlies, it's basically in your mid latitudes. Now, let's just quickly go back to our top diagram over here. There you can see it. There's your subpolar, this subpolar low pressure, there's your high pressure, there's your low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. Okay? Keep in mind that deflection is different in the northern hemisphere. So let's look at the southern hemisphere. High pressure, low pressure. High pressure, low pressure. Because of Coriolis force, deflect it to the left. Because of the Coriolis force, deflect it to the left. Because of the Coriolis force, deflect it to the left. And as you can see, tropical easterlies, the westerlies, and the polar easterlies. Now, So, in this lesson, we've covered the following concepts. The synoptic charts. Most importantly, over there, you need to be able to determine what season the synoptic chart is, how to read the synoptic chart, and how to interpret the synoptic chart. Keep in mind the little clues like the date, the temperature on the weather station models. Look at the Calario high pressure system. If it's over the interior, what do we know? It's winter. If there's a low pressure over the interior, it's a summer because of very warm conditions. The temperature, cool temperatures, winter. Very warm temperatures, summer. And a dead giveaway is obviously our date. Then we look at the high pressure systems and low pressure systems. Once again, what do we know about low pressure, high pressure systems? It's sinking air, anti-clockwise circulation. Okay, low pressure systems, it's rising air, clockwise circulation of air in the Southern Hemisphere. Remember both of them for the Southern Hemisphere. And then the weather station models. Very importantly, grade 12. It's easy marks. Describe the weather and use the symbols as being in the weather station models to be able to describe the weather. For instance, tell us what's the temperature. Tell us what's the dew point temperature. Tell us the cloud cover. Tell us the wind direction and the wind speed. And finally, global air circulation. Global air circulation, we looked at it. The vertical movement of air 
and the horizontal movement of air. Now, as you know it, vertical movement of air is the low pressure systems and the high pressure systems, and the horizontal movement of air is air moving from a high pressure to a low pressure. But very importantly, unfortunately, air just don't move from that high pressure to the low pressure because we got a force, and it's known as the Corollis force, that deflects the wind. Now, this wind is deflected because of the rotation of the Earth around its own axis. And that deflection is to the left. And that creates the polar easterlies, the westerlies, and the tropical easterlies. Thank you for watching. Until the next time.